So welcome to those that have joined. Um, we're just waiting for a few more people to join the webinar. Um, so uh, we'll start in a couple of minutes. Thank you. If you want to um, add into the chat where you're from, uh, what you do, maybe, uh, it'd be nice to get to know people in some way. <clears throat> I'm from the UK uh, uh, in a lovely town called Leamington Spa, um, about two hours away from London. So whereabouts, where are you from? Don't be shy, please share. Couple more minutes. Thank you for those that have joined. We'll be uh, starting the webinar in a in a short while. We're just waiting for more uh, uh, attendees to arrive. Is that our Risto there? Is that Risto that I know in the audience? Okay, we've got some more people uh, joining. We're just waiting for a few more attendees to arrive and then we'll be starting the webinar very shortly, about five past. Thank you for joining. If you wanna add Yeah, if you wanna add into the chat where you're from, uh, what you do, that'd be great. <clears throat> I'm, and uh, for those that have joined, I'm from the UK and uh, based out in a town called Leamington Spire in the heart of England. Okay, got one more minute. We'll be starting in one minute. Should have a countdown, shouldn't we? That'd be nice. One more, uh, few more seconds. Let's wait. Right, five past. Let's start the podcast. Okay. Oh, I've got a question already. Let me just check that out. Oh, Harry, welcome from the Netherlands. Great to, great to meet you. So, welcome to an IT Labs webinar on a very, very important and pertinent topic in the big wide world of tech. Let's introduce myself first. I am Tarlock and Gil. Sounds like a character out of Game of Thrones, right? So let's make it easier. You can call me TC, by, you can call me TC, which is my nickname. It's a lot easier on the tongue. I'm an electronic software engineer turned business agilist. Once engineering tech, now an architect and engineer of people, especially developing effective and empowering leaders. I'm also IT Lab's Chief Talking Officer, that's a CTO with a little c, and I interview, in those, in those uh, podcasts, I interview um, tech leaders about their leadership and experiences on their past and current tech journeys. So please check out CTO Confessions podcast on Spotify if you get a chance or any other popular streaming services, that's CTO Confessions. So why are we doing this webinar? So before I start, I wanna throw a quote in that will focus our minds and deepen the importance of why this webinar matters. And it's a quote that was shared to me by a wonderful colleague, Tino, who, who uh, shared it with me and I thought it was brilliant. So I wanna bring it to you as well. There are only two types of organizations, those that have been hacked and those that don't know it yet. Boom, quite impactful, right? And it kind of focuses your mind a little bit about the importance of security and cybersecurity, which is what this webinar is about. 
We live in a very strange world where even abstract entities can attack us. So in this space, we're going to be talking about this thing called NIS, the Network and Information Security Directive, in particular NIS2. What is NIS2? Well, it comes into enforcement this year. OK, so we're, there's a little bit of a, a clock ticking away here. It's a continuation of the original introduced back in 2020. And it's going to be expanding the number of, se a number of sexes it covers from seven to 15. And there are some serious implications if you fail to comply. So really focus your minds, listen in. I'm no expert in this field, but I am very curious about it. I know how important it is. So let's exercise that curiosity with our wonderful guests, Sanad Aruk and Goran Chamu Roski. Okay, so I'm going to invite them in. Do you want to turn your cameras on, gentlemen? Senad, welcome. Hello. Uh, hello. And uh, Goran, do you want to join us? Excellent. You're on mute at the moment, sir. Yes, just a moment. Thank you. Excellent. Good. Thank I can you. hear you loud and clear. Welcome, welcome. So we're going to be using the security terminology of red and blue and purple teams here. And we're going to, I'm going to describe as such. And in the blue team or the blue corner is you, Goran. So please give a short introduction about yourself. What do you do and why is this topic so much of a passion for you? Okay, I'm a cybersecurity professional in the last 20 years. I have a company that uh, is strictly dedicated to this area. And uh, since 2004, uh, I'm delivering services, uh, solutions, consultancies, uh, audits, trainings related with, uh, at the past it was information security, but now it is completely cyber security. Okay. So uh, during this, uh, my career, I was following different kind of uh, regulations and I was uh, implementing them by delivering this kind of services to the clients. Fantastic. Mainly in the, in the regulated uh, environment. And now these uh, industries are with this uh, uh, to they are becoming regulated. They they've been even before regulated, but now it becomes more difficult to implement this. What is required? Excellent. Well, welcome, Goran. I'm really looking forward to the discussion we're going to be having together. But first, let's introduce Senad. Senad, why are you passionate about this, and and what do you do? Yeah, so thanks for the invitation, guys. My name is Senat Aruk. Uh, I am a CEO and founder of Imperum IO. So a long time in cybersecurity. I used to be in multiple, uh, let's say, segments in cybersecurity. So working for a, for a SOC services, then moving for a vendor. And then right now I am myself a vendor. So basically, yeah, I spend a long, a long time in cybersecurity, especially on incident response, threat hunting, building cybersecurity operation centers, implementing them. Uh, and and doing uh, everything that is tied to the information security and cyber security. Uh, yeah, so today, uh, as you mentioned, uh, as Megora mentioned, so I'm going to cover mostly about that part about you know how much you know uh, you know this kind of regulations and and rules and 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 laws can protect against the hackers, right? So basically, you know, uh, we are we are extremely good. You know, to uh, to 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 implement this kind of best practices or regulations, you know, against the auditors, right? But what about in the real world, right? <laughs> because we are not going to be attacked by the auditors, right? We are going to be attacked by the real people. So yes, that's my part here. I'm happy to be here. So, yeah, fantastic. That's it's us. great to have you on. And I forgot <laughs> to mention that actually you're in the red corner, okay? So your red team, okay? Um, so thank you both. Thank you for both for joining this. Um, so we have our red team and blue team kind of analogy going on here. And of course, both of you will come together as a purple team to discuss and dance with the topics in the space. And I've got some nice questions here to kind of kick off the conversation. And hope, I'm really looking forward to how the conversation falls. So, so to everybody knows this isn't scripted. We're having a, a live conversation about the topics and learning from our experts here. So now that we've got to know, now that we've got to know each other, let's get to the nitty gritty. And the audience, as I mentioned before, if you've got any questions, please add them to the Q&A tool uh, that is at the kind of bottom, I don't know, somewhere around here, okay? And we can collect them and hopefully mop them up during the session. So the first question I'm gonna fire into the space and I will go off camera while you two discuss this uh, and come back in when I've got another question lined up for you 
is why does this matter? Why does this matter? Okay, so uh, the regulation uh, matter a lot, a lot because it is a mandatory requirement and uh, uh, it applies to all these uh, industries uh, that uh, we can number later on maybe. But uh, I must uh, say at the beginning, uh, I, I must put the, the scope more narrow because we will discuss here just for the cyber security aspects of this regulation and not for all, all, all other hazards because uh, the regulation has all hazards approach and uh, we will, because the time is limited, we will dedicate our time uh, and efforts to this part related with uh, cyber security. As a cyber security regulation, uh, this regulation is uh, more like uh, NIST-like. Uh, NIST uh, cyber security uh, uh, framework has uh, set the standards as GDPR has set the standards for privacy and uh, it is more dynamically, uh, let's say, uh, it has more dynamic approach. So it has some cycles like uh, identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. And it has an inner, uh, I, I would say, transcendent uh, govern cycle. So you see, it is not a list of controls that should be implemented, but it uh, should uh, implement some environment in which the, this dynamic will will uh, will be uh, used uh, to uh, protect against the attacks. Uh, then, what is important uh, is that th this is a risk-based regulation, and uh, because of this, we can uh, we can set the, the 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 subject that we are talking now uh, away from the controls that are required because everybody can read the controls and can understand them. But when we have a risk-based regulation, then the risk assessment is the most uh, important thing that should be done properly. And we have uh, two dimensions of uh, risk here. One is a long-term risk life cycle uh, that should uh, lead us to the security architecture. And the other is near real, uh, real-time uh, adaptive risk life cycle that should be embedded in operations. That is very important because we should have uh, this capability uh, to understand our risk posture. So other aspects of the regulation are the penalties. They are very huge, but not as much as GDPR. Uh, and uh, this is, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, a game in which the, the impact side should be, of the risk should be increased. And uh, it sends the message to the companies, it is better to spend this money that you may be penalized for budgeting the implementation than to, uh, <laughs> to then, uh, if you don't uh, do that, then you will be penalized and you will, however, uh, lose this money. Then we have uh, supervision that is uh, something new uh, that puts accountability on the top management. So. It will be more frequent, it will be ad hoc, it will uh, require some documentation to be sent to the regulators and so on in each country. And then on the end, we have a breach notification. Uh, this breach notification with, within uh, 24 hours is with the intention to increase the capabilities of the companies to be capable, <laughs> not just to, to uh, report but to be capable to detect and even to protect because uh, any breach notification will lead to some uh, follow-up of the regulator but however uh, the question was why is this important the most uh, important thing is not within the regulation if we think out of the box box the most important thing i think and main uh, challenge is that uh, environment has changed. So Underworld has become more professional and hybrid warfare more hostile. So we must give credits uh, for anticipation uh, of this environment change uh, in the last, let's say, two years, <laughs> even more, uh, to, to the needs that they've been uh, somehow 
or they were having inside the information that this will happening. And uh, during the discussion, we will see that even uh, this regulation is uh, not enough with the things that are happening. So uh, they've said that on uh, 2027, there will be a revision of this NIS directive. And I think that that will be uh, completely new because of this environmental change. So in this regulation, we don't have some protections that are needed for the time even now and for the time that, that is coming. So the regulation is not here just to fill in some check boxes uh, because uh, we may uh, look very naive uh, to the attackers. Don't you think so, Senat? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you. I mean, you know, when, when I'm thinking about why why we are forced or why the companies are forced to, you know, to obey to NIS2 or GDPR or PCI DSS, right? I mean, the main reason of this is because we, like a human beings, we like to evade these kind of things, right? We, we like to we like to suffer and to forget, right? I mean, something is, is same is same in in a, in a normal life, right? We must obey some rules, traffic rules, or whatever kind of rules, right? If we don't obey, they're good, they're, good, they're, they're going to be a fine. And why why there is a fine? Because while we are ignoring this kind of rules, maybe we are putting somebody else in the danger, right? So I mean, I don't care if you are if you are going to. You know, uh, I don't know. Uh, put your, uh, put your, uh, you know, uh, a car west or not on, on, on uh, to protect yourself, right? I mean, you're going to do some, some other damage because you're not following the rules to a third party, right? So even even in the cybersecurity world, is the same, right? So basically, I mean, a lot of companies who who don't obey to this kind of rules, you know, they basically they think that you know if something happened or there is nothing going to happen to them, and they can recover, right? And everything is fine. That they can deal with the loss, right? Money lost or reputation lost. Yeah, that's fine for them, for themselves. But what about the, the third parties that are going to get, you know, uh, involved or going to get hurt by this, by this uh, neglected, you know, approach from this company? So again, uh, regulations are here and the fines are here uh, because, you know, like a human beings, we like to evade these kind of things, you know. You are on mute, Gil. Yes, let me come off mute. That might help. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's really interesting hearing you. I, um, as I was listening, I was kind of listening of any stories that you have of where, um, you know, where this hasn't been taken to heart and the implications of that from your red team and your blue team kind of perspective. Uh, look, let, let me tell you a, a, a very simple, right? I mean, in, uh, here, a, a, a very basic sample again. So basically, you know, uh, I mean, uh, in in a cybersecurity world, is the same like like in our in our normal life, right? I mean, if there is nothing. I don't see any difference between them, right? So when 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 I when I when I'm going to work, right? What I do, I believe that I'm not going to get hacked, right? I believe that there there there, there not going to be something bad uh, and stuff like that. But still, you know, I'm forced to do to have some kind of uh, you know measures, right? I mean, I know that I'm not going to get hacked, but I still need an EDR, I need an NDR, I need a technology who is going to prevent this kind of things going to happen, right? Why? In cybersecurity world, because we believe that something's going to happen. You know, that's that's the main the main you know narrative here. Uh, it's the same on the private in the private life, right? I mean, uh, why why are you are putting your seat well, uh, your your seat best, right? Because you don't trust the, uh, the the brakes of the car, right? Or you don't trust the third party. Maybe somebody else is going to drive you. From the opposite and and he can harm me right so it's same in the cybersecurity world right so basically we know there's something going to happen and we put uh we put a lot of measurements in place or we believe that uh, you know god going to protect us and something nothing going to happen so we are you know not investing on this kind of this kind of things but as you mentioned before right i mean uh, you know in cybersecurity world especially these days especially in these dynamics right uh, i think that you know the main the main concept uh, that needs to be adopted is is the is the assume breach mindset right so we so we need to we need to understand that something going to happen for sure and to take the precautions about it is the same with when we are driving okay we need to know that something can happen that's why we need to have uh sit west and and brakes and and to drive properly and to respect the rules right so it's the same approach uh, unfortunately, you know, like a human beings, uh, you know, we, uh, we, 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 uh, we don't follow these kind of rules and that's why, you know, these kind of standards are in place. 
So, so have, have you got any stories of, of people that haven't followed the kind of advice and some of these kind of regulations around Yes, that? yes, there, there are many stories and we will come to them later on, maybe, probably. <laughs> but I, there are, you, you know, uh, I want to focus on the three factors that are most sophisticated and uh, because I think that this story will go uh, longer if we uh, see these three factors and we can divide them in two groups. One is related with uh, the ransomware attacks that are very frequent and that are happening. And uh, these are, com com <laughs> as, a, as a matter of fact, this is a business already. And the other part is related with the state-sponsored attack. Like for example, case of solar winds, where we have uh, some vendor in the supply chain attacked by some attack, and then uh, this uh, malicious code is spreaded from the supply chain of the vendor to all other to to the clients of this vendor, and that has uh, caused uh, uh, impact. So these are two two profiles of, of attackers that are very so sophisticated. But as a blue team, let's say I first want to see. Uh, what are the characteristics of the battlefield? I think uh, uh, first uh, uh, first question is where is the perimeter now in this uh, turmoil? Uh, uh, and uh, we may wait for the answers, but <laughs> I will say, that it is at the endpoints, users, and identities. So this perimeter is different than from the past where we were having a kind of castle that was uh, surrounded with walls, with water, and uh, within the water we were having crocodiles. And we have only one bridge where we control who gets in, we identify him and authorize, and we let him in the castle. Now. In the modern architecture, business mainly because of the business, we have uh, uh, more architecture that is like a Swiss cheese. You know, we have suppliers, partners, employees, everybody gets in, gets out. Uh, they are delivering their services, uh, transferring data, files, uh, whatever. Uh, and we must let them to finish their job. So we, as a security uh, professionals, we, we cannot uh, close everything, so the business must go on. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, now uh, perimeter looks uh, more like uh, that we are fighting on bayonet. You know, when the soldiers are putting ba bayonets or, on their uh, guns and they are going uh, one to each other uh, very closely. So we, we, and even it happens that we, we don't believe in our uh, in identities and integrity of our employees. So uh, uh, that's why we are talking about zero trust paradigm. That is a new paradigm that is change. So instead of trust but check, we now say don't trust and check. That is very difficult to be implemented in the environment where all these uh, uh, actors should deliver their services. Uh, so the most uh, concerning here uh, factor are the people. As Senate said, uh, people are the ones who are not <laughs> obeying the rules. And uh, at the same time, because of this, they are more probable attack vector. That's why in uh, this regulation, uh, needs to, we have training as mandatory requirements, training and awareness that there is a difference. Uh, so uh, as you see, the perimeter is not uh, something like uh, what we are invited uh, classically in the wars, but war is happening at uh, every place, wherever we have endpoint, we have some identity, we have some user, then the war is there. And uh, we must admit, as a blue team, that it's very probable that adversary would have lack in a door by misusing some of our users and their identities. 
Yeah, so I mean, yeah. just to add something to just that Gordon mentioned, I mean, what, 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 if you're checking the NIS, right, NIS 2, NIS 2, right, I mean, you're going to see that asset management and especially the, the, the identification of your of the critical infrastructure and the assets are very important, okay? So let me just tell you one uh, one sample about this, okay? So I'm coming, I used to work for a, uh, for a large vendor in the past and I remember a story, very interesting story over there, right? So, you know, a lot of, a lot of companies are doing a POCs, proof of concept, right? So they, before buying something, they like to try different, different, different technologies, right? And, uh, and, and this is a true story, by the way. So basically, a, a very, very large enterprise in the United States, they got hacked by a POC device that they forgot that exists in their data center, okay? And this is reality. So basically, they, they wanted to buy some, I don't know, some next-gen firewall or whatever, whatever it is, right? And then they invited four or five vendors to do a POC. And, you know, five vendors, they brought a lot of hardware in their environment. And one of the vendors forgot one device, right? Nobody knows that the device is there, right? And after two years... This device is a Linux Unix device, right? So basically got some, you know, unpatched vulnerabilities and then they, they got hacked by a device which they don't own, okay? Which was forgotten during a POC. This is a real scenario, okay? So again, I mean, when we're speaking, when we're speaking from the attacker's perspective, right? So the attackers have the, all the time in the world to identify the right asset, to attack the right asset on the right time, okay? And then they know exactly, you know, uh, when they're in, they they can they can check the perimeter and then they, they can start to avoid to avoid the, the the alarm systems like logging system and alarm systems and EDRs and NDRs and stuff like that. So basically, you know, again, when we are speaking about about the NIST two, you know, it's really important to know all of these these kind of assets. And then you know you need to prepare yourself for the risk management. Okay, and then of course incident handling and reporting is also another very important topic here. Okay, because. Uh, incident reporting and handling uh, means that when something's going to happen, you need to uh, you need to you need to face the incident, and then you need to recover by it, and then you need to report it. Okay, so these are three main steps in the in the, in in the space. So when when something happens on the company, when there is an incident, right? So uh, from from the top management, nobody going to ask you, hey, you know, uh, why you didn't detect? You had this technology and this technology, right? They are always going to ask you why you didn't detect faster, okay? <laughs> and then why you didn't respond faster, okay? We give you all the tools, we give you all the solutions, you know. I mean, it's useless for them to explain, you know, you know, uh, yes, we had a solution, but there was a zero day attack or APT attack, and we got hacked, right? They don't go, they they are not going to understand this, okay? There is always, you know, this challenging question why you didn't attacking the time. So again, when, when I'm speaking about when we are seeing, uh, especially about, you know, about doing the incident response in-house or versus like a service, like a service, okay? So we know that, you know, this kind of services are very hard to build in-house because of the lack of people, lack of right technology and keeping going and keeping the people in the company is, is really a big challenge, right? That's why, uh, you know, incident response and 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 threat detection services can be also outsourced. You know, that 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 this kind of services what can be taken by other other parties, right? So that's why I mean, uh, w w w when I see a company who who you know who had some breach and then they you know they suffer from a, from a lot of uh, from this kind of you know neglected things. I mean, if 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 there are Fortune five hundred companies, right? I mean. Uh, you know, uh, and and the same thing happens for a very 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 small company, which you know there are maybe five employees. Okay, so breach is same for everybody. Okay, the only big thing here, here is the impact and the and the and the brand reputation in the place. Uh, again, uh, another thing is you know is to uh, is th there is a very interesting story in cybersecurity when I go to the customers, they don't know what they don't know. I'm serious. Okay, so this is the biggest 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 problem in cybersecurity. Okay. Uh, because, uh, yeah, as I told you, they don't know what they don't know, you know. And then they want to buy something. They want to buy something to fix some problem, but they don't know, you know, exactly how that problem can happen, uh, what, how, to, how to fix that problem, okay? Because sometimes a lot of companies are just buying something because of, you know, Gartner says is good or because the competition brought it and they want to implement in their in premises, right? Which is, if you ask me, this is totally wrong, okay? Okay. Uh, Again, you know, uh, when we are speaking from my perspective, you know, when, when if I if I want to go against a company who has a needs to, you know, best practices in place, you know, for me, I don't care, right? I mean, I'm going to try to fix. I, I'm going I'm going to try to find a non-vulnerable application. I'm going to find a non-patchable system. I'm going to find a, 
a, a, a technology that can that can uh, that can uh, drive me in, as 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 Goran mentioned, right? I mean, I may, maybe I'm going to go to a supplier, right? So, because I cannot I cannot breach directly, so I'm going to figure out who with whom they are dealing and doing the business. So I'm going to try to avoid and to go from that door, or you know, the most dangerous one. Always human is a weak weak link, right? I'm going to start social engineering, right? And right now, I mean, uh, if if uh, at the age of AI and generative AI, right? Especially, you know, I mean, the uh, the success rate of the phishing attacks has been above seventy percent right now. Okay, because you can ask ChatGTP to prepare you a perfect phishing email. Okay. Uh, for a specific company, for a specific topic, uh, you know, by just by giving the company domain, okay, and and just by giving the the, the project details, right? So this is really dangerous right now, okay. Uh, just today, I heard from a friend of mine here, you know, uh, that uh, you know a, a very very famous, you know, anti phishing company in the world, you know, they are right now uh, having a problem with the detection because a lot of phishing attacks generated by AI is not anymore detectable by the traditional technology, so they now. They want to implement uh, AI to detect. It's not AI. A pre- pre- okay. prince from... <laughs> Sorry, it is not pri- prince from Nigeria. <laughs> yeah, no, that's my point. I mean, at the, at the past, you know, prince of of Nigeria, he was just copying, pasting the same phishing email, right? And it was easy to figure out. Right now, it's really dangerous, you know. It is uh, that's uh, yeah, yes. yeah. And then uh, you know uh, network network especially especially if if I want to attack a company from uh, who has who has all these standards right then I'm going to check how they are they going to detect me when I'm going to do lateral movement right so that's NDR you know network detection response you know technologies are coming in place I'm going to start fingerprinting to figure out if they have an NDR or not because I need to I need to be able to live inside us longer without getting detected right and then uh, persistency I need to land somewhere. And then I need to keep myself there, right? So that that's, that means I'm going to touch the endpoints. Now I'm going to ask them, hey, do they have EDR? Do they have a, you know, next gen AV and stuff like that? So basically, you know, this how things for me like an attacker. This this is what I'm going to check. You know, uh, I don't care if they had the NIST two or, or PCA DSS or whatever it is. Yes, right? yes, so, I understand that. <laughs> it is yeah. easier to attack because you you can try this and that and <laughs> yeah, some yeah. will work. Uh, so yeah. uh, the defense. Uh, as a blue team, uh, I I think uh, that uh, it is important to know your enemy and to know yourself. So these two parts, if you know your enemy and you know yourself, then you should not take care about the, the battles that are coming. So this is a uh, um, art of war. <laughs> Susan Tzu has said that. Mm. And uh, who are um, who is the enemy that uh, these two should uh, prepare us for? So uh, I think because at the beginning I've said that uh, I'm uh, dividing them uh, in two groups. One are state-sponsored attacks that are very sophisticated, uh, and uh, these uh, industries uh, are and may be targets uh, because they are important and essential industries. Uh, then there is an underworld uh, that has become, in meantime, prof- very professional, organized, profitable enterprise with organizational uh, layers that have uh, knowledge and skills and are specialized for different tasks. So, example of uh, their professionalism is that, uh, for example, one ransomware group uh, has... Uh, SLA that 90 95% of the cases where they uh, uh, receive the payment uh, the data will be decrypted so this is very business like way <laughs> in approaching this uh, and uh, then uh, for example you can buy a, a software as a service to deliver ransomware and on a model pay as you go so when you do some business, then you will pay. <laughs> if you don't do that, then you, you're not paying. Or, uh, uh, so on the other uh, side, we, do, we don't have a hacker. It is not a hacker. It is, it is very motivated, motivated by ideology or money, highly skilled professional army or well-organized underworld enterprise. And 
Three tactors have comparable level of expertise with the most skillful cyber defense professionals. So that is our enemy. That is how we should envisage our enemy. Now regarding how did you start this, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, about that uh, asset that was forgotten, that is uh, what I'm saying, uh, knowing yourself. So uh, uh, to know ourselves or one company to know what are uh, his risk profile, first they must do risk assessment uh, and produce risk treatment plan that then in two to three years will uh, uh, implement the security architecture that is required based on the risk profile that they have, because some of them are less risky, some of them are more risky. And then uh, uh, the most important thing, why, why is this difference? Why, why I'm mentioning the NIST uh, regulation or cybersecurity framework? You should have a near real-time adaptive risk posture tool or solution that will uh, continuously assess assets, even the ones that are not uh, known to you, they, it will discover them. Uh, then uh, uh, finding vulnerabilities, misconfigurations, and uh, correlate this information with the treat, treat intelligence source. So in near real time, you should have a picture what is your uh, current risk posture? That is against uh, the threats, against the threats that we know that they exist, right? Okay, yes, <laughs> unknown, unknown, so, some yeah, others because, because, C, yeah, CTI means what we know that they exist, right? Yes, yes, it is. I understand that, and uh, there are other tools that because this is only basic, I, I'm calling this like a cyber hygiene on the technical level, on the infrastructure level. So if we are not hardening, if we are not patching, and we, if we are not correlating the treat intelligence information with the vulnerabilities that we have on our infrastructure, then we should not go beyond that because we are like open from all sides and it is not possible some sorts to be employed and to protect us. That is not possible. This is the first level to know yourself and of course on the end all this there are some constraints that could not uh, that we could not patch something you know and this should be closely monitored so now again we are aware that we have some vulnerabilities and it is not possible to patch them because of some old let's say uh, legacy software that we are using and we must live with that and then the story goes on so as uh, with the first cycles, we, we believe uh, that uh, there is a high probability that some uh, employee will be hacked or some employee will be uh, uh, without integrity and will put the, put the, the library, malicious library in our uh, software that we are delivering to our, to our clients. Mm -hmm. Probably that happens with the, with the solar emits. And the story goes on. So we, we just have uh, some two layers of protections at the moment, but we, we can go further with additional protections. Yeah. I, I just want to kind of touch on a topic that was brought up earlier on, these kind of concept of attack vectors. Does the NIS, NIS2 or NIS just generally talk about these kind of vectors? And is there like a, a database of these ve attack vectors? Because I can imagine you've got people being very creative. There's kind of patterns of attack vectors uh, where everybody can kind of learn from them. Is that something that's in the space? Mm, I mean, when we're speaking about from the from the delivery methods or attack vectors, right? I mean, uh, there is some general statistics in the world which, which touch base every single standard in the world. At the NIST 2, I don't think so there is a specific field like that. Or Goran knows better than me, but oh, I don't, yeah, I don't yes, think so there is First, it is a risk-based, as you said, yeah. statistics that is coming. Yeah. From ENISA. Yeah. In this case, because this is EU regulation, they are following ENISA statistics more. Yeah. That uh, uh, source, they can uh, see the uh, frequency of the attack vectors that has happened. And uh, from there, they can uh, somehow uh, use this uh, as a parameter 
to uh, calculate the, the probability. But right. in uh, two, we have something else that is required. They are, uh, they are mandating vulnerability disclosure. So in these industries, because there are very specific industries uh, that uh, we have uh, operational technology based industries here that is converging now to information technology, uh, but they are very specific. They have some vendors that are very real and uh, very uh, with a very big uh, market share. Now, uh, the, this regulation is asking that vulnerabilities must be disclosed and uh, there should be a database of these vulnerabilities where uh, other subjects in that industry can uh, check this and uh, find if their infrastructure has the same vulnerability. Sure, sure. Again, I mean, uh, look, I mean, if, if we are checking, if, I mean, if you're checking the NIST, right, I mean, you're going to see some some verticals, right, which they require, you know, to be specially covered by the NIST. But you're going to see that all these verticals are mission-critical infrastructures, okay, most of them, okay? Yes. So especially, especially energy transportation and stuff like that. And look, I mean, again, I'm going to touch base to the human factor here, right? I mean, we saw what happened during the COVID time, right? The most uh, the most important things that keep us alive was energy transportation. Yeah, this uh, healthcare, right? The communication. Okay, so these were the sectors who keep the world, you know, rolling in two years when we were locked in, right? So this automatically shows that these sectors are mission critical. Okay, so why? Uh, so if you are on this sector, if you are working on this sector, why you are waiting somebody to push you to implement something, right? You need to have your own, you know. Uh, let's say human, uh, you know, I mean, you know, uh, con conscious, consciousness, right? I mean, to that you need to do something based on some best practices, right? And then, you know, I I'm always saying this, you know, I mean, everybody who who, who jumps in, in cybersecurity, especially that now, now we see a lot of, you know, because there is a huge gap, a lot of new people are coming in cybersecurity from different sectors, you know, like, you know, a lot of advocates, a lot of, uh, you know, teachers, a lot of, People who never touch, you know, cybersecurity, they're trying trying to get in cybersecurity, and I, I'm always telling them the one thing, you know, in cybersecurity, you, you you're going to always walk in top of the jelly, you know, in top of the of the pelte, you know, <laughs> it's always shaky, you know, you don't know yeah. in which side you're going to fall, but you know, you still you need to keep going, you need to keep walking, right? Because you know the mindset, as I told you before, you know the assume breach mindset, right? You need to know that something going to happen, okay? And uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, you know, as I told you, as I as I, as, as I told before, right? I mean, uh, and and Goran mentioned that, right? I mean, uh, we like a red team, right? I mean, the the bad guys, okay? We're going to find a way to ev evade all these standards, you know, and mm -hmm. and to do the harm, right? And you know, uh, let let me tell you another another interesting story right now. I mean, especially this is by the any uh, by Anisa stand or by Anisa report, the last one, okay? So right now, you know, the, the, the in the European Union, we were speaking about about these vector, vectors, right? The still email, okay, the email is still the number one vector, you know, getting people infected. Okay. This is still number one because it's very easy to deliver, right? And the email, I mean, if, if we are checking the email technology, you know, email technology is very old. So basically, we never thought that, you know, we need to, we're going to have some, this, this kind of problems, right? So the email technology is not fixable today. You still can send a spoof emails. You still can do a lot of things, you know, that uh, that can bypass a lot of traditional technologies, you know. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, usually right now is, uh, as, as Gorna mentioned, you know, these supply chain attacks are more very important for them. I mean, if you go underground, uh, you're going to see that a lot of a lot of uh, you know supply chain hacked you know uh, hacks or something like that that is touching supply chain uh, they are selling for a huge money okay because that is making up amplification effect you know so you're going to hack or you're going to implement a code on something that everybody's going to download and they're going to use it can be a open source or it can be a a commercial product you know so that's that's very very important from this aspect uh, and then you know, uh, especially about when, when we are speaking right now, uh, the biggest the biggest problem is ransomware, right? I mean, you know, the ransomware is extremely big right now, and 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 you know, uh, at the past, I remember uh, 2012, I have a publication research article about the ransomware where I where I managed to break inside of the botnet, and I and I reveal how they work. 2012, okay, so even that time, you know, uh, the ransomware was very important, but. 
2012, when the ransomware attack started, I remember very, very well, you know, they were usually targeting end users. You know, they were not targeting too much, you know, large enterprises and stuff like that. And then, and then, you know, right now we see, you know, a large enterprises are getting, you know, hammered by ransomware gangs all the time. And then the, those people who are doing a ransomware attacks right now, they're not script kiddies. They're not, you know, students just to show, you know, smart themselves. They are heavily, heavily organized cybercrime underground mm-hmm. cyber crime and, and and you a lot of time you know they are hired by a, by a, i don't know by by, by a cocaine cartels by a, i don't know like a classical terrorist organization you know i mean ransomware became interesting you know you know uh, a lot of people uh, for money laundering you know everybody everybody can and uh, can deliver and then uh, if you are checking the ransomware success rates is really high high success rate on the ransomware attacks okay unfortunately and the reason the reason why the ransomware attacks are very popular, okay, uh, is because it's really easy to do, okay. I mean, in my time, uh, very old, you know, like old guys, cybersecurity, you know, we we were chasing the guys who were stealing credit card information all my life, okay. And now to to deliver a credit card information, you know, hack, it requires a multiple knowledge by a multiple different people. Because you need to do man in the middle of the officer attack, you need to bypass the second factor, you need to steal the credit card information, you need to do a drop zone, uh, you need to send the credit card information, you need to prepare a fake, uh, you know, websites and stuff like that. So, so to, to yeah, to uh, to to steal a one credit card information, you need to do a lot of things, and then to clean it up, you know, to sell it, you are taking more risk, okay? And then with the ransomware, you don't need to do nothing. You just need to go underground. You can you can buy for hundred dollars a ransomware attack, hundred yes. percent undetectable. You are you not rent. you are not in risk, and uh, you can gain no. money. No, I mean, <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, if you, if you want to take a ransom from your own people, from your own family, or your own company, you can just rent a ransomware server, and you can infect all your family. Okay. Yes. If if you don't like your Christmas gifts, so you can you can extract more money from them, right? I mean. <laughs> So exactly. again, you know, uh, ransomware is everywhere, and that's a big problem right now. You know, and then when we're sp- when we're speaking about the ransomware, you know, they bypass everything. I mean, there is no way to protect us against the ransomware. Okay, because if I am a bad guy and if I want to deliver a ransomware attack, right, I don't need to do any man in the middle. I don't need to bypass any, uh, you know, privilege escalation or nothing. Because ransomware means I'm going to encrypt the files that you own with your own pri- own privilege, right? So if I hack your machine, if I have access on your machine, using your own privileges, I can encrypt your files. I don't need to do any privilege escalation to get admin rights or whatever it is. Okay, so this is the problem. And, you know, that's why, you know, I'm, when, when, when I'm thinking about, you know, fighting the ransomware, we are really, really focusing on the threat itself. You know, we are not focusing on the on the behave. Okay. And and now I, I see some new new movements on the market, you know, uh, especially, you know, uh, some new patents from, especially from Luxembourg. There is a very interesting patent right now. Uh, I mean, the guy, the guy, the guys just contacted me, and they they have a very interesting, interesting solution. Okay, so they basically, what they do is that they don't fight the ransomware because they believe that ransomware are going to bypass everything and going to land on your machine. What they do, they uh, patented a technology which is not generating a private key for the ransomware. Okay, so basically, is it's useless. So this is like, you know, you know that somebody going to break in your house, but to open your safe, they need the electricity and you are not giving them electricity. That's it. Okay. That's the mindset. So I remember this kind of mindset has been in the past. I mean, I used to work for a, for a, for a, for a vendor who has, who had a technology who was protecting the endpoints against the Mimikatz attacks, right? For dumping the, the credentials, right? The domain controller. So we know that somebody going to craft a custom Mimikatz and he's going to bypass your ADR, AV, whatever it is, he's going to land on your machine. But to be able to dump the database or memory database from, from the Mimikatz, there is a specific library or spe- specific DLLs that you need to speak to them, right? So this technology was oh. protecting oh. these DLLs. And that's yeah. it, okay? So basically you can come with whatever you want, but you can dump the file. So this is different approach, right? Uh, yes, that's and in cybersecurity... The... Yes. Yes, there, there are like uh, AI and machine learning technologies that are uh, following how 
how the applications are behaving, so how these DLLs are, are behaving and then reacting if it is not something usual that should happen. But okay, regarding the, the, the weapons used, you've already mentioned to this uh, example with, uh, with uh, phishing, but in addition, you, 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 uh, th there is an evidence that AI is used uh, for spear phishing. So it is not just generating uh, very good email for phishing, but it gets data from uh, publicly uh, available sources for you, and it generates a specific email for your profile. For example, yep. it offers me a job in Israel for auditing the bank. And what was wrong? The money was very high to employ me. Yeah. So that was the only mistake because... <laughs> so he knows that I was uh, working in Israel and he knows that I'm an auditor in some assignments. And uh, he knows that I'm working for banks. So th this, a kind, this is a kind of spare phishing. Now, uh, but uh, taking the in consideration that the most uh, basic definition of AI is that it achieves objectives by learning and uh, the, the vulnerability in humans is the amygdala that we have. So imagine that uh, this kind of AI technology uh, will have a reflection of human amygdala across the world. So it will try, make mistakes, then succeed. And from all these experiences, because that is uh, how the, the real AI is working, he will uh, learn how to irritate our weakness, how to irritate our amygdala and to react. This is even more sophisticated attack. So it is using the AI in a method that uh, could manipulate us based on, on our psychological aspects. That is very frightening and it is very effective as a matter of fact. Uh, so uh, uh, when as a blue team, I am asking what, what, my, uh, what, what weapons they are using from the other side. And we, we obviously see that they are using AI ML and of course, we must use these advanced predictive algorithms also. But now the problem is that we are using them on a black box principle. We put something in a black box and we say, this is learning now and when it will learn, it will be effective. But it is not the case because uh, we must uh, achieve implementation of uh, AI based on uh, five V principles. So uh, for big data, these five V principles must be followed. And the first one is variety. So instead of the information from the network and from the endpoints, we should have many other sources that are structured data, semi-structured, unstructured, and combine them. Then we have uh, volume, of course, because this is a big data. Some of the companies, they don't have the volume to achieve this. They, they cannot produce enough volume. Then we have velocity. Velocity is collecting and analyzing data in real time. Because if we want to protect us from the attacker that is attacking us in real time, then we must react in real time. Uh, then we have value, because uh, this is a kind of optimization, all this data that is used. So we can uh, narrow the, the uh, complexity and uh, processing uh, performance needed. Because if we don't uh, know from which uh, attributes the value of uh, our AI comes, we cannot uh, optimize this. And on the end, we have veracity, something that is called veracity, that is accuracy and completeness of data that uh, at this time, time could be attacked. Because if somebody attacks our accuracy and completeness of data, then our AI algorithm will not work well. So uh, if uh, this implementation is correct, we will have uh, AI tool uh, as an instance that is uh, very capable uh, it will have a very high level of capabilities 
uh, and uh, in other case, uh, our vendor will say us, okay, but uh, this uh, instance is still, still learning. It takes years to learn something <laughs> in some cases. <laughs> so if you want to achieve uh, this, uh, us SLA based on false positives and penalize for false negatives. If somebody signs this contract based on this SLA, then you are okay. You can take that tool and use it. That's great. This is fascinating. I, I must admit, I'm not a security person myself, but listening in, it's a, it's a whole world which I'm not aware of. And um, so if I was a business owner, I, I kind of, you know, if I was listening to this webinar, I don't forgot any business owners there. You know, there's a, there's a lot of fear in the space here. You know, should I be frightened as a business owner? Yes. I mean, <laughs> right. because you, yeah, yeah, definitely yes. Because you're only in your responsibility, you know, to obey for some best practices, okay? Yeah, that was the next what I wanted to, you know, I mean, look, I mean, if you're a cybersecurity professional, right? You need to do your job and you need to do your job based on some knowledge, right? I mean, we are taking some structural knowledge to become a cybersecurity professional. And then to be able to serve like a cybersecurity professional, you need to obey to some kind of compliance. It's simple. I mean, you know, they're normal, right? And, uh, you know, in, a, in, in my world, in cybersecurity technical world, we know all these standard, you know, like, uh, like I don't know, like uh, like NIST 800 or OWASP top 10 or SANS top 25 or MITRE attack, MITRE defend. You know, this is, you know, this is the, 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 the you know, the catalog or this is the, you know, some kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a database from where we are trying to figure out and to have all, uh, you know, technology in place to detect or protect against these kind of things. Same is for this too, okay? And again, uh, you know, uh, can a company implement needs to by himself? Yes and no. It's dependent on how big is a company and stuff like that, right? But, you know, NIST2 has a deadline. A lot of companies right now, again, human behave, right? Uh, you know, delivery time, uh, 1st of January and everybody until, you know, uh, end of uh, end of December, nobody is moving, right? I mean, until uh, 31 of December, nobody is doing anything, right? That's normal in our, in our, in our world. It's because if you check in IT world, everything starts with a code with developers and this is a developer behave, okay? He have a delivery after five days, four days he's enjoying and the last day he is working 24 hours, okay? And this, and this uh, you know, culture has been replicated in every every layer of, of IT and cybersecurity and stuff like that. So that's why, you know, IT Labs or Goran, Goran's company and other, other companies in the world, you know, they provide uh, this kind of services, right? For me, uh, I am a technical guy, so I can just try to, you know, help from the technology perspective, you know, to 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 fulfill the gaps uh, within the MITRE attack, right? <laughs> uh, which then MITRE attack needs to be also a checklist within the within the NIST two or, or or NIST eight hundred or whatever it is. So okay, so what we need to do is very well defined. You see, okay, I mean, there is no, I mean, this is black and white. It's simple, okay. But uh, again, uh, and then you know, in cybersecurity world, you know. We professionals like us, you know, we are very flexible, honestly, you know. Let me tell you a sample. I mean, when, when we are at home, like a cybersecurity professionals, right? We like to have HTTPS. Uh, we, we, we don't like, uh, we like to use Tor. We like to use uh, uh, external DNS services, right? So we, we take care of our privacy when we are at our home, right? Same as when we step in in a company, we like to see every DNS request of our employees. We don't want employees to use HTTPS because we are blind. We don't want anybody to use Tor because we are afraid of it, right? So it's a shift, right? So we, we are flexible to shifting on the same day from home to work, 100% different person, right? So the same should happen in cybersecurity, right? I mean, uh, people need to, needs to understand that, you know, uh, if you are taking care, uh, I mean, uh, your personal photos are same like your personal or corporate files. They're same, okay? Because those corporate files, maybe somebody has the value of a photo, okay? Like your own photograph, right? I mean, that's why you know, you know, uh, this kind of standard like uh, like we have in the in the place needs to be needs to be implemented. 
and the companies who are not going to follow them, uh, of course, they need they need to have some kind of uh, you know uh, push to them to implement it. And you know, uh, we know what what this can be, because for our, for the people, for the bad guys, as I told you, uh, it, does this too going to protect you? No, doesn't matter. I mean, uh, does I mean even even if you have every single standard in the world, you're still going to get hacked, right? This is this is the reality of the world. But again, uh, as Gona mentioned, right, you're going to recover faster. You're going to know how to react. You, you, business continuity in place. Gona mentioned a little bit about the risk, right? You know, you, you, you're going to know how which risk can be accepted but controlled, which risk can be trans, uh, you know, transferred, and which risk can be mitigated, right? Uh, I, I mean, I still, I still think that, uh, I still think that, you know, uh, there, there are a lot of things to do in cybersecurity. And again, cybersecurity is not an expense. That's the biggest problem. I mean, a lot of companies uh, see cybersecurity as like an expense. No, cybersecurity money is like electricity. It's a bill that you need to pay. That that's it. I mean, if you if you don't pay, you don't have it. Simple as okay. that. Okay. Yes. I mean, and the most expensive here are the people. So as a blue team, yes, I'm asking myself what uh, people I should employ and what are their competencies against the attackers, because they should be comparable, at least. Mm. If not, uh, <laughs> they should outperform them, but it is not possible, so comparable, let's say. So uh, we must, uh, because of uh, uh, this, uh, uh, to achieve uh, situational awareness, as I've said, the people are weak, somebody will be fished. Uh, infrastructure can be patched, but something, some constraint can um, not uh, would not allow us to patch it. Mm -hmm. And something will happen, and we should have a, a, a people that are employed in some in some kind of security operations center that will monitor this uh, kind of uh, attacks that are still happening. So we are not uh, bulletproof. Still, yes. <laughs> yes. And having the people, uh, in my understanding, here generals are the data scientists and ML and AI engineers. Then we have lower grade titles like uh, data engineers, uh, ETL engineers, software developers, and uh, normal soldiers are incident handlers. So you see the 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 span of uh, let's say profiles that we need to have. Mm -hmm. is very huge and as senate said uh, it is best uh, to outsource if you could not develop this kind of profiles and keep them employed in your yes. uh, uh, company so the uh, on the other side if, as we mentioned the attackers are very skillful i remember that senate has one discovered one hacker with nick nickname fibonacci and he, he was some italian but not whoever, but yeah. famous mathematician from 20th century that has his sequence, uh, Fibonacci sequence, that is a golden ratio. And that is uh, even now used in algorithms for uh, randomness and hashing. So that hacker was sending the message from the other side about his skills, that he is skillful, that he is a mathematician. That was his message the ones who are defending on the other side. Wow. Uh, uh, and uh, so uh, the most expensive is the stuff. If you want to develop this, because you must uh, have these monitoring capabilities. And uh, here we have uh, many false positives that should be followed up. Uh, we don't want to have uh, uh, false negatives because uh, that means that we we will not discover something that is happening. Mm -hmm. So uh, this uh, optimization can be done only by data scientists who are working on this data in some data lake that we've mentioned that are implemented on the basis of this 5V and they are optimizing how the false negatives against false positives would be uh, managed to be optimized. Mm -hmm. so that, that is uh, mainly the the SLA should be based uh, on uh, on these uh, two parameters, and the right right formula here is uh, for for us as a blue team uh, lose less time in chasing 
the events, the incidents, and to use more time in preventing. Because yes. if you prevent something, if you uh, if you attacker see that you are uh, strong enough, he will uh, let you go. So yeah. he will uh, spend money and time with you. <laughs> I, I guess I guess they're kind of opportunists. They kind of poke around and see if there's something, which actually brings me to an interesting point, because we talked about the concept of obviously we've got the red team and the blue team, and then we've got the idea of a blue team. Do you, do people like yourselves come together to, to create a kind of like, we need to see if this company is complying, but also to see probe it, because you don't know what you don't know, as you kind of mentioned a few times, you don't know what the attacks are, we don't know what the vectors are. Does that happen in your industry? Uh, yes, I mean, you know, yeah, definitely, I mean, you know, there are a lot of a lot of mature companies. They have a inside on red teams and blue teams, right? On the same under the same roof. Okay. So basically, usually the red teams are smaller than the blue teams. That's how it is, you know. But uh, yeah, I mean, you, generally, you know, we 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 are complementary to each other, right? I mean, I mean, we are the problem. They are the solution. They are the solution. We are the problem. So that's that's how it goes. Mm. That's how it goes. Like a, a virus and antivirus. That's how it is. You know. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's um it it's the same like um a really interesting but you know your your description earlier on uh, Goran around you know know your enemy and know yourself you know you the auditing knowing what software you and to send out story around knowing that certain software hasn't been patched um especially with the open source uh kind of field where you know you might have software wrapped around open source software that is, and it's kind of embedded further down in the kind of layers. So you've got to have an audit of that as well. Uh, is that something that happens in most companies or is this, is this a gap? Oh, look, I mean, that, you just step in in a very interesting story. I mean, you know, and open source has been used everywhere, okay? Uh, we use open source like a products and then we build something else. We use open source libraries. We use a lot of open source, but oh, nobody is checking them, right? So wow. because open source, so there are a lot of, you know, open source, uh, you know, uh, scanning tools or, or vulnerability scanning mm -hmm. tools. But again, uh, again, you know, uh, it's really important to know what you use where. Okay, so that's really important. And again, open source means software development, means that's something you are building and implementing. So again, even for that, in our world, we have a standard. SSDLC, right? Secure software development lifecycle. So you need to, if you follow SSDLC, you are not going to have so much problems, right? So again, if you follow some kind of standard that has been implemented in the in the cybersecurity, uh, doesn't matter if you're going to use open source or in-house development, you still can manage, you know, some kind of risk and 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 things like that. And you know, okay, I mean, uh, yes, Gordon. On the end, we must admit that uh, yes, uh, we, it is very difficult to to put some software that you are using uh, legacy software aside because he, it is vulnerable, and maybe you should live with that, <laughs> especially in some industries. And in that case, this uh, monitoring uh, and uh, protection and detection capabilities of the security operations center are coming on price so they are more uh, required but uh, regarding you've mentioned uh, miter uh, attack uh, this uh, as a blue team i'm uh, looking as this uh, uh, that uh, what what knowledge and what skills my employees should have to work in this security operations center and uh, exactly this uh, let's say uh, I would say techniques and tactics that are used by these uh, frameworks uh, that are based on cybersecurity kill chain are used. But except this, we have insider threat detection. So MITER is developing insider threat detection because in this case of solar winds, what has happened? Some internal employee has been paid to put the library in the software of the vendor and then it was distributed to the uh, clients wow. and uh, something that we we call uh, as an auditors uh, it was uh, having an it has a name definitive media library so you should have a library where from you must know where each file coming in from how it is tested, how the quality assurance, how security testing is done. And then it comes to this library that will be complied 
co <laughs> compiled and distributed. So in this case, this definitive media library that is some control that is already invented was not uh, followed properly because attacker has succeeded to put this file inside to distribute to all the clients and then, then to put out of this library, not to be discovered. So, but it was never revoked from the client instances and he was uh, being capable to uh, make the data leakage for more, more than one year, taking in consideration that this vendor is very, uh, very, it has a huge market share. It was uh, an impact probably that uh, now we cannot calculate. Wow. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, also, for example, we have uh, now, we have a trademark and uh, patents on privacy kill chain. So pick per kill chain we have, because in all these uh, cases, you see, we are taking a lot of, uh, lot of personal data because this user and entity behavior analytics, fraud management, uh, then uh, privilege access management, insider treats. We are taking a lot of personal data about the behavior of the of the users that are our users of or of the clients, and then we must take care about the privacy aspects while implementing the cybersecurity. Wow! Because we we can be penalized by GDPR. That is even <laughs> even more kind of a more, yes yes. So, I mean, it's again, you know, the compliance, I think this is very important that people get educated on this and obviously reach out to experts like yourself. So we're moving now into the Q&A kind of section of the uh, webinar, and we've got two questions lined up for you. So I'm going to throw them at you. OK, and uh, and then, you know, uh, together you can answer them. So the first question is, is how does NIS2 align with other cybersecurity frameworks such as ISO 2000? 27,001 NIST and uh, CS, CSF, and that's from Harry MPBV. Do you want to read that again to you? Yes, I can yep. answer this. Go. Cool. Yes. Yep, I, I, everything which is paper security, I'm pushing to Goran, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right, good. No, I, I must have everything on paper because the blue team should have a blueprint for the security. You see? <laughs> and then we will implement that and then we are ready to fight. <laughs> okay, so I mentioned on the beginning, uh, I want to uh, lift up a little bit the NIST 2 to, and to, to interpret it as a NIST cybersecurity framework. Because NIST cybersecurity framework that uh, uh, was mentioned here in the question is the uh, at the moment is it is a standard for cybersecurity regulations, while uh, ISO twenty seven thousand and one is something that is uh, more basic. So although it has uh, uh, the controls like uh, data leakage protection or like threat intelligence or like uh, endpoint detection and protection, now in the new version from two thousand twenty two. Uh, they are not uh, so uh, connected like this uh, uh, dynamic, uh, let's say, structure that is developed in NIST uh, cybersecurity framework. So, yes, they are aligned, but if I compare them, uh, ISO 27001 is something that is basic, that everybody should have. So the standard for bottom line, this kind of ISO standards, then NIST 2 is more advanced now with the new version, but NIST cybersecurity uh, framework is the most advanced. So uh, always when I am implementing this kind of uh, uh, systems, I am uh, uh, using the NIST cybersecurity framework as a reference. Also, I am uh, and uh, I I know how to connect, so they are related. Wow. That is the, the answer. Uh, how to connect, uh, what is required uh, in the NIST 2, how it should be implemented in the NIST cybersecurity framework. Fantastic. I can imagine, Goran, when you get updates on these ISOs and these uh, standards, you get all excited and start kind of reading uh, what the updates are, okay? You... 
<laughs> yes, I'm reading because but, uh, but I'm invited. I I know to read. Uh, I I really I'm. Uh, yeah. I was yeah. learning my TISA uh, exam from the uh, or PMP exam from from the source, not from yeah. the books. So I learned to to read the regulations and to understand because in the regulation one, one word could mean a lot. Yeah. Because for example, in GDPR, resilience was mentioned only once, but it means cybersecurity. Right. Okay. <laughs> good. Good. So, uh, Sela, do you want to add anything to that? I've got another question lined up for you. Uh, no, I mean, let's go to other questions because people are, you know, already. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, we can, hour, we can so. take more questions. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So this one is, um, I, I, I do apologize, I, I can't pronounce this name. Um, but the question is, is how can SOC help for incident management? Oh, that's a good, I can take that one. So, <laughs> yep. Yep. So cybersecurity operational centers, right? I mean, uh, they are they are designed to detect and to respond, right? So that's why, I mean, having the right tools and right people in the cybersecurity operational center, it doesn't matter if you're going to host them in-house or you're going to host them externally, right? They're going to help you to do incident response when something is happening, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, cybersecurity operation centers were around from the beginning of the of the, of the the cybersecurity journey, right? That we know they got evolved, you know, they changed the shape, but they're always there, right? And uh, again, if we are if we are checking right now from the from the technology perspective, we're going to see that, you know, the SOX has been powered by XDR, by the SOAR, by DFER, by EDR, by NDR so tools, right? Uh, but, you know, uh, companies investing all in these tools, uh, usually they are, rising the complexity right because if you check uh, average tool set per company is 20 there are minimum 20 security vendors in the companies right now okay av nation firewall eds aps and stuff like that right sure. so if you have 20 cyber security tools you have 20 guis and somebody needs to take care of these 10 20 guis right so that's why you know we invest in the socks we invest in the sock platforms where we can combine all the guis under the one pane of glass and where we can lead uh, every every kind of incident from level one to level three, under the one pane of glass. So yeah, the uh, the question is, is 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 okay. Yes, and uh, you know there needs to requires you know incident response and you know in in who goes to do incident response uh, the team at the SOC or the SOC or outsource SOC or in house SOC. So yeah, that can help a lot. Fantastic. Thank you. Good Thank question, you. by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, guest. Uh, so uh, hopefully that's kind of answered both those questions that we got lined up here. I was going to uh, uh, inch w the one that I had lined up around what can companies do? Because, you know, if I was a business owner, I'd probably be uh, boggling my mind at the moment. Think, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? So how can organizations effectively prepare for the for the up and coming changes, not only to be complying, but also for their own safety and organizational um, uh, kind of safety, really? Maybe go on. Yes, okay. So <laughs> if you follow, you know, this uh, bad name of the regulations uh, has come because the implementations are not uh, done properly. So mainly, if you follow the regulation, it is not just about the compliance. I'm not doing that uh, in the implementations that I'm delivering. I'm doing this to be effective, to have effective security and safety for the organization. And this should be done in a very, uh, in a way that is not like, a, like big consulting companies are doing that. They are just taking some methodology and they are asking yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And on the end it will come everything is no because you don't understand each other. And because the, that consultant is uh, some junior level that uh, don't uh, understand the, the relevancy of what is your business and how I can make uh, security uh, that is risk-based appropriate for your level of risk profile and to don't uh, and it need to, to be cost optimized so yeah. it should not cost you more than than it is uh, required so okay. that that is that relevancy is very important for the for the uh, CEO levels, and when when I am discussing with them, uh, because I have always uh, questions, what is the most uh, riskiest uh, aspect of my business? And I must uh, 
come quickly to this uh, answer because he knows that that's why he is asking me. <laughs> yes. Really? He knows why he is not sleeping at night. Mm. And if I make a wrong <laughs> answer, then <laughs> I mm. lose the assignment. But of course, uh, that's why I have uh, this many certification. I have my MBA that give me the, let's say, some uh, clear picture of what business is and how we will, uh, how we should assess this. And that uh, helps a lot. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Goran. Hey, do you want to add anything to that, Senna? Uh, no, I mean, uh, Goran just explained everything, so good, I good. Mean, I'm fine with the answer. So we've just got another question in, actually, from Damien um, Stonioski. Um, do apologise if I messed that name up. I'm still learning the kind of Balkan name uh, convention. Being in the UK, we're a little bit ignorant to these things, so I do apologise for our ignorance. Um, how crucial is network architecture and application architecture design when considering cybersecurity? And actually, this one really resonates with me from being a software engineer, because I, whenever I've worked on software projects, security back in the day when I was doing my C++ embedded stuff, it was always an afterthought. It was always something we thought about after we'd finished the application. So how crucial is network architecture and application architecture design important when we're looking at cybersecurity? Oh, it's very important. Yeah, the, the design by security, security by design, right? There is a term, terminology for this, right? So you, you build something, you test static dynamic test, then you build something else, you check static dynamic test, and then when you release the product, you do the, the pen test, right? I mean, it's simple as that. Uh, this is from the development perspective. From the implementation perspective, of course, there is some best practice that you, you need to follow by designing the network, right? So uh, network segmentation, network visibility, network forensics, having visibility on the network is really important, right? I mean, and you know, uh, we all like uh, TLS 1.3 and SSH, SSL and stuff like that, but that is making us blind, right? So mm. uh, that's uh, that's a very biggest challenge in the market right now, right? To have a visibility on the network, right? Because if you are a bad guy, you're going to try to hide yourself and you're going to hide within the technologies that everybody use for the privacy, you know, requirements. So privacy is, you know, is actually helping the bad guys. Yeah, that's a reality. But that's the game that we need to fight. And again, uh, who's going to win? Nobody. There is no winner of this. And this, this, sure. this, is, uh, this, is, this is going to go forever like this. Oh, because if there was a winner... Yeah, if this was, if there was a winner, we were not in this call because nobody going to hire us, nobody going to buy our solution. If there is a magic box who can fix everything, right? Yes. In cybersecurity, and if the if this war war had a winner, winner, then we we were not even in this call again, right? We know who is the winner, and there is no more cybersecurity problems, right? So this war going to continue, and, and that's why we are here. That's why we are trying to do something, and that's why we are actually you know working. So yeah. yeah. Excellent. Uh, that's my answer for that. Brilliant. So uh, we come to the kind of closing arc of our time together um, uh, just before I do my close. So what, what are the key takeaways that you'd like to leave our audience uh, and people listening to this recording? Around okay, maybe go on some short, short... Yes, uh, yet, uh, I can start. Yes. First, uh, because uh, I want to say that uh, we must be aware that uh, the environment has changed. So the 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 uh, most challenging is the environment, not the regulation itself. The regulation is just giving us some uh, way how to approach this. But we we must be even more creative because attackers have become more professional and uh, they are uh, becoming more more. Uh, sophisticated, if I can say professional, but whatever. <laughs> and uh, they, they earn from this. So they are very motivated or they have some ideology. So they are very motivated again. So this change in the environment, I think, was anticipated by the NIS2 directive. That's why it is here. But from the discussion that we were having, we see that even we must go beyond this regulation because of the environment. That is the first takeaway. Then the second uh, one is that we must use AI and ML properly. At the moment, they are not using. The big vendors are selling black boxes that have a promise, false promise, that uh, uh, it will learn and it will protect you in some future. 
but uh, we must uh, use them in the security operation center properly. But this, uh, by implementing this uh, uh, 5V uh, principles of uh, big data and uh, AI and ML are based on big data. So we must implement this. And on the end, I, I would say that uh, we didn't mention that, but through my uh, discussion, I was trying to, to show you the, how the defense in depth should be, should be architectured. That means that in each point, I was saying to myself, but why, what if this failed? But why if this failed? So we must have many, many layers of uh, uh, this defense and to have uh, to follow this paradigm of uh, defense in depth. So uh, it should go across people, processes, technology, services, and data. And the other paradigm that is modern paradigm is zero trust. We should uh, try to uh, go for zero trust solutions mm -hmm. that are still in development. But, but for example, one example, um, Hackers are uh, always trying to find uh, some interface where uh, uh, some document could be uploaded or some document could be sent through email. Now we have a zero trust uh, solution that is called content disarm and reconstruction. So it doesn't trust, it is not like antivirus, even not, not like uh, next generation antivirus. It doesn't work on the sandbox principles because the attackers have uh, learned how to uh, go around this uh, sandbox. They will just uh, sit there and uh, do nothing until you put them in the infrastructure. That was case in SolarWinds also. They were having a timer inside, not mm -hmm. to react when they get at the infrastructure, but later on. And these uh, content disarm and reconstructions take each and every file uh, uh, put it uh, in, in its uh, normal form if it is Word or a PDF and with that it makes disarming of the file if there is some malicious inside and then reconstruct it and give to the end user to read it or to use it. So each and every file goes through this procedure. So these are new paradigms. Defense and depth is not new but zero trust is new and we should try to implement them. Brilliant. That sounds sounds interesting. Do you want to add anything to that, Senna? There's a key takeaway, final key takeaway? Uh, I mean, uh, that was a very, uh, very explan explanatory, I mean, uh, takeaway. So for me, I'm going to just <laughs> keep it short. I mean, yeah, uh, I mean, again, as I mentioned before, you know, assume the bridge mindset should be adopted. Okay. Uh, take away from this one. Uh, there are rules. We need to, we need to obey the rules. Okay. Uh, cybersecurity shortage is realistic. Okay, there is a shortage of the people, so we need to invest more and more in the people, education, training. AI is here. AI is going to change a lot of things. Already started to changing, right? So uh, last thing. Uh, okay, I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, I I wish that everybody can uh, can understand, you know, the seriousness of this because we live on 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 a matrix. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, we must obey the rules. So. Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, assume, assume, assume bridge mindset. I mean, uh, every day uh, when you wake up, uh, you, you always need to focus that something going to happen. And again, uh, when, when I'm speaking to the leadership and the cybersecurity world, I always, you know, encourage them to be predictive. Okay, we, you must be predictive. You must think predictive. Okay, because the the bad guys are always one step in front of you. That's why uh, prediction is really important. That's all from my side. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you both. I've really enjoyed the session. I always think a good day is when I go away and I've learned something and I've learned lots, even in this kind <laughs> of a, this short time. So thank you for that. And hopefully our, our audience, our attending, attendees have learned that as well. So a big thank you to you both. I've really enjoyed the conversation. Um, also, a big thanks to IT Labs for setting this up, particularly Tino and Georgina for, uh, for doing the magic and bringing this together. Uh, you'll be happy to know that IT Labs is providing some training around NIS2. Uh, and if you want to know more details, check out the link shared in the comments, uh, which is coming now. Um, we've also got various channels which we kind of put stuff out on. So please register interest in the in that area. Um, 
Uh, there'll be other webinars coming up as well. So, you know, obviously register with these channels to see when they come up and uh, these webinars are provided as a, as a kind of courtesy to the community for learning. Um, um, so I'm going to close again with the quote I've mentioned earlier. There are only two types of organisations in this world. Those that, that have been hacked and those that don't know it yet. OK, it's a great quote because it really focuses the mind. So be safe, be wise and look after each other and learn about NIS too. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you, TC, and to all the team that has uh, very well prepared this. Thank you, Senat. I hope that we will meet. Yep. <laughs> for, for, first time in Macedonia. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> bye bye, guys. Bye. Thanks for bye. the organization. Bye. Thanks. Thank for you. Thank you, audience, for joining us.